Mm. We've heard also about this chicken and egg sort of situation with training students and training teachers, language teachers mm. as well. Is there not opportunities for teacher exchange as well? So we're not trying to create uh, teachers. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and the Ende and the Endeavour scholarships did that as well. Uh, we had we just started that in two thousand and seven, where um, the Endeavour language teacher fellowships are actually bringing Indonesian teachers to Australia to do intensive language courses in Australia. So we did have that two way going. I don't think it's been enhanced. I think it was another one of those. It was it was our idea. So they'll come up with something else rebadge it, rename it or something. But it was something that I was um, very much keen to, to do, um, bring Asian teachers to Australia, Australian teachers to Asia, and the same with students. I think these two-way exchanges are invaluable. Invaluable. Yeah. Um, on a rather different note, do you believe um, that the Australian-China relationship would, would, would be different? Um, and if yes, how? If the Chinese government wasn't um, I guess you could say run, run by the uh, so-called communist uh, party and also operating with a closed economy. I think it would be vastly different if it was still a closed economy. Yes, I do. Uh, I'm not so much focused on the system of government as, the, um, as our ability to interact with China. And as China has moved from a closed economy to an open market economy, our relationship has been significantly enhanced. Uh, we have common interests. We have common strategic interests. Um, I, I'm a great believer in democracy, but I'm also not in a position to dictate to another country that our system of government is right for that country. And I think too often when we seek to lecture other countries, about their system of government. We don't perhaps consider some of the challenges that they face at their history, um, their circumstances, their geographic location, their population, the composition. I mean, China is 1.2 billion people, 56 ethnic groups. Uh, massive challenges to peacefully govern a country like that. Now, would a democracy work? I don't know. I don't know. The transition <laughs> could be extremely painful. But what I am very enthusiastic about is the Chinese government's willingness to embrace an open market economy. And I think that we should be um, very supportive of the efforts that Chinese government is making in that regard. It's certainly in our, let's face it, it's certainly in our interests, in our trading interests. And I believe it will change um, many relationships that China has around the world as it continues to do so. I'm sure that the relationship between China and the United States would not be at its current level if China was still a closed economy. And let's face it, if you're trading with another country, um, you're likely to maintain peaceful relations with that other country. And particularly given that China and Australia's interests are so aligned, um, we need China to buy our export commodities. China needs our export commodities to fuel their economy, literally. So we have greatly aligned strategic and commercial interests. Sure, we part company on a couple of touchstone issues. Human rights, freedoms, democracy. But I think if we can deal with those in a respectful way, the relationship can only enhance. And that's why I say the human rights dialogue is so important. It is so important. Because people have the opportunity to listen to what we have to say about law reform, for example. But see, in my, just even in my lifetime, I've seen a dramatic change in uh, dealing with China. As I said, law firms just weren't doing any work in, in China in the 1990s. But now there's a, quite an open flow of legal services and law firms and legal personnel between China and the rest of the world. Yeah. Julie, you spoke a lot on educational exchange programs and I think everyone here agrees on its benefits. Um, why do you think China-Sino relationship, the relationship is in such a precarious position in light of the fact that we have a um, fluent Mandarin speaking Prime Minister who studied, lived and worked, worked in China um, what, if there was two or three main reasons as to why this relationship has deteriorated, 
It's been put to me on a number of occasions by a number of senior Chinese people that just because you speak Mandarin doesn't make you an expert on Chinese affairs. And I think there was an expectation that because we had a Mandarin speaking Prime Minister, there would be a new relationship with China. That is something you can never assume nor take for granted. Relationships are hard work. Any sort of relationship is hard work. And the Australia-Chinese relationship has its challenges. As I've said, we, we, we have differences when it comes to freedom, human rights, democracies. But we have so many things uh, in common, increasingly so. But it's not a relationship you could ever take for granted and it has to be worked at. So the assumption that it was going to a whole new level just because we had a Prime Minister who speaks Mandarin was misplaced. Uh, I have said before, and many other people have said before, that um, there were some initial incidences that perhaps on their own can be excused, but collectively sent a rather arrogant message. Uh, the first related to the Prime Minister choosing to make a speech to Chinese students at Peking University with an admonition to the Chinese government about human rights. He did it on his first official trip to China prior to his official reception by the President of China. So this lecture was not well received. Again, it's not what you say, it's how you do it and how you go about it. And I understand that um, the Chinese government were not particularly pleased to have the Prime Minister of Australia before the official meetings with the Chinese government lecturing Chinese students at Peking University in Mandarin about the failings of the government. Now, OK, put yourself in the reverse position. Say we had the Chinese president coming to Australia on his first official visit and before meeting with the Prime Minister or the Governor-General or whomever, the night before, decides to go along to an Australian university and, in English, speak about the gross failings of the Australian government in its treatment of Indigenous Australians. And then turn up the next day as if it's all OK. There's a diplomatic way of doing things. I would have met with the Chinese president and spoken to him about my concerns. And if I was still so determined to feed the press gallery back in Canberra, because that's what it was all about, I would have at least told him what I intended to do. That didn't happen. I think that was the beginning. Then there was this quite bizarre behaviour over the visit to Australia of the Chinese propaganda minister. And the Prime Minister didn't tell the Australian media that he was meeting with the Chinese propaganda minister, yet all the Chinese media were invited. So the story was beamed back home in Beijing, but nobody in Australia knew of the meeting. That is odd. What was the Prime Minister trying to say? I'm not close to China, or I am close to China. I mean, what was the message? So it got people concerned about his relationship with China. And then he went overseas to the United States and promoted China's interests in the International Monetary Fund. Now, there's nothing new about that. Peter Costello was very, very vocal about giving China a greater say in the International Monetary Fund. Very vocal, particularly when we had a, a meeting of the G20 in Melbourne pushing for China to have a greater say. 